this is not true. Uh, the situation now is that we can re-tangle. Of course, problems do persist. Uh, there are things which uh, we still don't understand. Uh, but in general, I must say that uh, at this moment, uh, we have reached uh, a stage where we can understand properly, I think, about 80% of what is real. Uh, some things still remain obscure, and we will uh, deal with those in the due time. Uh, now, the topic of this uh, first presentation uh, was also, I think, suggested while I was prompted by uh, Dr. Hansen here. Uh, <coughs> she said that once I gave a presentation and it was very obscure, I must say, and then I was talking about things which, like, a couple of people only like knew what I was talking about. I was very happy. <laughs> and then uh, everyone said, hey, what was that? Say it again. <laughs> and then uh, then she says that, well, why don't you uh, write a paper or make a presentation? So, like, basically, uh, what can we find out from the Tangut texts which we otherwise cannot find out? Or which we otherwise will not be able to know? And that was, I think, a very good idea, a very good suggestion. I have to thank you for this, because uh, really now I have started working in this direction, basically trying to show uh, what can we know uh, from the Tangut text, which we otherwise have no way of finding out. Uh, and for today, I think we, uh, uh, what I was thinking was to discuss, I mean, what's actually in the Tangut files, yeah? Uh, what was discovered there, and uh, what is it all about, and uh, how can we, like, use it? Uh, now, I must say, because here, uh, as you can see on my first slide, yeah, that is just a very brief list, uh, or, and incomplete also, uh, because I have basically neglected a lot of things, yeah, uh, uh, which um, indicates the uh, Chinese sources, uh, which are dealing with the Tangut subject matter. Now, as you can see, uh, uh, partially, uh, uh, the, the list is opened by the three very famous uh, Stele inscriptions. Uh, none of those uh, survives in its adequate form except for the Ganyan uh, Tabe, yeah, which is still can be seen in Lanzo Bovan, but uh, there are all those uh, <coughs> uh, uh, patients or uh, 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 rubbings of those, so this can be considered as legitimate sources. And what follows below is the collections uh, of the documents or personal collections of the people from the Yuan dynasty, uh, uh, the historical compositions which were put together also during basically the Qing dynasty, uh, and the Buddhist history from the Yuan period. And others, yeah. All those sources uh, also, if we of course consider the information on the Tangus uh, from the traditional histories uh, from before. Uh, they actually present a fairly, mm, I would say, complete picture, at least on the surface, uh, of the political history of the Tangut state. Uh, much less uh, about ideology, even less about the society, but the political outline, I mean, the imperial reigns, the wars, uh, the international relations, uh, they are pretty much uh, completely presented. Uh, therefore, I think in the field of the Tangut studies, I mean, all those, the problems still persist, yeah, and some of those are very intriguing ones. Uh, but generally, political history, I think, is uh, not of this enormous interest. And uh, quite understandably so, yeah, uh, that uh, if we talk about the mm, earliest stage of the Tangut history, most of those, for example, Dao Xiu Wu and Miao Xiu Dian Li, all those uh, texts were not very well known to the Western scholars uh, during the earlier time of the Tangut history. Uh, but other than that, uh, we should say that the political history of uh, Tangut was pretty much uh, familiar, or was pretty much known uh, in the, let's say, uh, during the Qing uh, dynasty. Anyway. Uh, so what was really discovered, if you can look, I have this picture here, uh, which I specifically put, that's uh, Kozlov, the, the, the Kozlov's expedition to Harakota, that's the first picture, Kozlov, as you can see, uh, is uh, the most beautiful, the other most can see here, <laughs> so, mm, the, the, that's their start next, uh, the, 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 the starting point, I mean, that's where, before they left, uh, for Harakota, uh, then you can see, and this is how Harakota looks now, 
that's just, those are, I'm not afraid to put those because I took those myself, yeah? Uh, uh, the funny part about that, I think, as uh, most of you know here, is that those stupas over there, yeah, those, those, these are not original, yeah? Uh, these were restored, and <laughs> so, actually during the Cultural Revolution, too. Uh, but nonetheless, yeah. Uh, but uh, overall landscape didn't really change that much. Of course, when Kozlov came there, there was no fence. Yeah? <laughs> and there was also no uh, fair collectors there, yeah? Because when I first came to Harahot, it was free. When I came there the second time, it was 40 yuan. Uh, now I went there for the second time, it was 120 yuan. <laughs> and also 30 yuan for that electric car, yeah? So together it makes up 150. But, yeah, so, but not, not that. And also there is a fence, of course. Now, when I first came there, there was no fence. Uh, and this is the actual picture, I mean, you can say, I mean, probably everyone uh, is familiar with that. Yeah, that's this famous stupa, <coughs> yeah, uh, which was located outside of the city walls, yeah, and something which remained intact for some reason, and something with the stupa which they have opened up and basically destroying that. And that is where uh, the most of the tangled collections or of tangled texts come from, yeah. Uh, a very rough calculation of the things which are kept in St. Petersburg uh, basically returns about 10,000 items, yeah, maybe more. So, uh, in my calculation at least, it's probably it's the second largest manuscript collection uh, next to the Don Juan, yeah, because Uyghurs don't have that much, yeah. And of course, yeah, that's always a warning for myself, so if I don't do time good studies properly, that's how I... <laughs> that's what that <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, always put this as a warning, yeah, so I have to study it properly. Uh, yeah, so and uh, this is uh, the result of the cause of the so-called excavations, yeah. Uh, the uh, inside, the interior of that stupa uh, was uh, very interesting, yeah, because uh, there is a problem, uh, something which I guess will never be really resolved, is that uh, who was really buried in that stupa, yeah? Because that's a burial place. Uh, uh, and how Kozlov described that in his diary uh, is that those clay statues of monks, yeah? They were seated in a circle, and they had those big uh, pot here. Uh, sutra text, the Mahaprajna Paramita, as was established later, uh, just in the same manner, uh, while they were basically carrying out a Dharma assembly, a Dharma action. Uh, and there was a woman buried there, probably a woman. Uh, my senior colleague uh, Menshikov, yeah, who was also studying uh, Harakoto, Chinese text from Harakoto, uh, he once uh, suggested that what was probably a female burial. Uh, and my another professor, uh, Kichanov, uh, doubted it very much. Uh, the problem with the person yeah, who was buried in the stoop is uh, kind of complicated, because as we know from the sources, from other sources, uh, the wife of the longest ruling uh, Chinese, uh, Tangut Emperor Renzong, yeah, who basically mm, he ruled from 1137 to uh, 85, so almost like one third of the Tangut history uh, was under his reign. And now, when he passed away, uh, due to political reasons, uh, his empress was expelled. And uh, some people believe that she was sent over to Harakoto. Because Harakoto in the Tangut, in the Tangut times, that was a place of exile, yeah? Uh, Kozlov originally thought that that was a Tangut capital, yeah? And so he was himself a very romantic person. He was put, no, he was writing poetry, and he was uh, in his diary, uh, as far as I remember, and my professor, Chanov, also told me that is like all those very romantic lines saying like, now finally I will be able to see again you, my beloved Harakoto, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the problem is, however, that uh, among the texts which were discovered in Harakoto, uh, a substantial, well, several 
uh, Buddhist sutras, I am fortunate I don't have those pictures here with me, uh, they buried the seal of Empress Lo, who was uh, Renzong's uh, wife, Renzong's empress. And uh, some uh, uh, texts were printed on the yellow paper, uh, which was understood as the imperial color. So uh, Menshikov and others, they chose to believe that that's probably the mm, uh, burial of the Empress Lo, which can be true, can be not true. That's, I guess, uh, maybe even irrelevant for the moment. Uh, so, uh, what happened next is that uh, the manuscripts, the collections, they were taken to St. Petersburg to the so-called Asiatic Museum, Russian Academy of Science, or Imperial Academy of Sciences, and the first exhibition was organized. And basically, uh, this is a picture, uh, the actual from the first exhibition, if I'm not mistaken, at uh, uh, 1910. Now, as you can see, all those manuscripts were just presented in this way. Uh, uh, those of you who had chance to uh, visit uh, uh, Institute of Oriental Studies or Institute of Oriental Manuscript, as it is now called, in St. Petersburg, they probably had a chance to see nothing changed much. Uh, even that, uh, no, even that picture behind, which is the portrait of uh, Rimado Matteo Ricci, yeah, it's still there. So <laughs> that kind of shows how the uh, the, uh, the tradition maintains itself. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and uh, uh, this is another story. Uh, that is uh, the story of the power struggle, yeah? Uh, which, mm, I would say, troubled uh, ten good studies from the very beginning. Uh, the one in the middle, I guess, uh, is a rather famous person, as Academician Alexeyev, who was at that time Mandarin of uh, Synology in St. Petersburg University. And to the two sides, I mean, uh, 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 this particular gentleman with a moustache, that's a famous scholar, uh, linguist, and historian, Ivanov. Uh, Ivanov is particularly important for the uh, Chinese studies because he was a Chinese teacher of Bernhard Kaglen. Uh, Kaglen studied Chinese in St. Petersburg from 1912 to 1914, if I'm not mistaken, and he was his professor. Yeah, uh, I found that this is, for some reason, this fact is not publicized. Uh, I found it out just by chance when I was reading that, I must admit, I'm sorry, a Wikipedia article on Carl. Uh, but then I checked it out and that's true. So, yeah, and this is another gentleman, that's Nevsky, another very famous Russian also linguist and historian as well, uh, who was Alexei's famous, uh, uh, sorry, favorite student. And uh, uh, so uh, the way it worked yeah, is when the Tangut manuscripts were first identified and developed because that, uh, the work of identification was done before. And French scholars like Daviria, Maurice, and others, they more or less have identified uh, that those weird characters, yeah, that those are Tangut. Uh, now the problem is that uh, originally Ivanov started that work and then Nevsky continued uh, under the guidance of Alexeyev, yeah, and Nevsky was also a very famous Japanologist, uh, the one who founded the so-called Japanese dialectology, yeah, Japanese dialects, that was his invention, basically. Uh, and also, I think, the one who was first to study the so-called Palo-Asian language, not Palo-Asian, uh, Austro-Asian, the Taiwanese languages, yeah, that was also his. Now, the problem is that, I must say that, uh, the major development uh, during that first period uh, yeah, so then that's again, that's the Chinese scholars, Van Zinru and Lofu San, so again. Uh, so what was discovered there uh, among the Tango texts? I mean, first of all, we should like look at those things like in a more uh, general way, yeah? Because when uh, Kozlov first discovered those things, he of course had no idea what that is. Uh, Kozlov didn't know Chinese, he didn't know Tibetan, he didn't know anything, basically. Uh, he was uh, an officer uh, in the let's say, Russian intelligence, yeah? Uh, the, uh, when the scholars uh, started examining, uh, then it became clear uh, from the very first moment, yeah, that there is a variety of texts, yeah, uh, of all sorts of subject matter. But, of course, uh, only very few could have been identified from the beginning. Now, uh, 
what we can say now yeah, is that uh, all sorts of texts were discovered. For example, here I put, as you can see, that's very easy. Yeah? Uh, this is the, that's a contract, yeah? that's a legal document. Uh, when people say that they still that they can read it, no problem. I doubt that strongly. Yeah. Uh, now uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, what is this? Writing exercise. Yes, of course. That's a writing exercise. Yeah. So uh, we can probably when we teach language, we can probably use that too. <laughs> uh, now there is another uh, another uh, legal document, and that's a copy of a Buddhist sutra. That's just to demonstrate a variety. Yeah. And this is not taken, uh, this picture is not taken particularly nicely, but that's one of the examples of the Tangut poetry, uh, which is also, I think, in itself, yeah. we will find out. Now, in this uh, first handout, which we have, now I guess it here, uh, it's a little bit long, and I must say that probably even some, somehow hectic, yeah? Uh, but I have more or less tried to uh, summarize, yeah? what we have. So pages basically, I mean this 